opportunity to be here, and I ask, Lord, that you will bring forth your word and make it light to us in Jesus' name. I've been working on the message this week, and normally I would have worked on it all day yesterday to the exclusion of everything else. And I had been praying about it, um, you know, what God would have me do yesterday, and he gave me a release to go on a special assignment. Hallelujah. And that's where I was right there. At the state capitol, where that picture was taken. And that is our anointed battle flag from this house, which I had to take down, Angela. You had it so nicely placed up there, so I have to put it back up. It looked beautiful when I came up. I was looking at it like, wow, that's perfectly you know, placed up there. But praise God, it, it had to go with us and into service. So thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I want to open the message today by telling you a hunting story. But please listen closely because what I'm sharing with you today is not really about hunting. Many years ago, I had been hunting hard with my son, Jordan, and neither of us had gotten a buck. And it was getting late in the season, the second week. Anyone who's ever hunted understands that sometimes after the season wears on, you start to wonder where, where are the bucks? Plan A, B, C, and D haven't worked out, so what now? You know, every day, well, maybe I should go here, maybe I should go there. What should I do? And then one night, Jody, now Pastor Jody, my wife, who has had many words spoken to her about a prophetic gifting, had a dream. And the next day, she excitedly and expectantly told us all about the dream, which seemed very real to her, in which she saw us getting a four-point buck in a place that was by a river. Now, in the dream, it was actually Jordan who got the buck, but I'll share a little bit more about that later. When Jody shared the dream, I was pretty sure I knew where the place was that she had seen because it was an area that we hunted before and it actually had river in the name. Now it's important to understand that what God was doing here was very personal to us. His engagement with me and us was being filtered through our souls. He was teaching us about himself, our relationship with him, and the prophetic, as well as simply loving and blessing us. So my wife had a dream about us getting a buck in a place I thought I knew. We marveled simply about the fact that she had the dream. It was a good dream, kind of cool to hear. You know, we enjoyed hearing it. It was nice to imagine or ponder in our souls. Now, this didn't happen in this case amongst the small group of people who Jody shared this dream, but when there is opposition to what God has said, we need to choose what to believe, who to believe. And in this case, everyone just received the dream with joy. Okay, so where do I choose to go hunting? Where did I choose to go hunting? Well, I chose to go to the place I believe she had seen in the dream, right? And here is one of the things with prophecy. You have to choose to align with it. Amen. I could have easily just disregarded it as just a dream. And that would have been the end of that. Mm -hmm. Or I could have thought that I had a better plan for the next hunt, and that would have been the end of that. But I chose to go to the place in the dream. It was encouragement. And it added a bit of excitement and expectancy as we made our way there and headed into the woods 
and we split up. We went our separate ways. I hunting in one area, Jordan hunting in another. Now I didn't just walk into the woods saying, okay, where's my buck? I hunted as hard as I possibly could. The dream didn't have the effect of giving a false expectation that I didn't have to do anything. It was actually encouragement to hunt as hard as I possibly could. Applying all of the hunting knowledge and skill that I had. Now I chose a place to sit that I knew I had scouted and I believed it to be the perfect spot. It had natural features which made it a travel corridor for the deer. And I sat quietly and still for the next couple hours. And it was the kind of night where the woods were very, very quiet, that kind of eerily quiet and still. And the least sound or movement that I was to make would alert any approaching deer. And I had to sit in a place where I was kind of exposed a bit, but it was the perfect spot otherwise. So that meant letting my nose run without wiping it and making absolutely sure not to even shift my weight too quickly or in a way that made noise. And while I was sitting there, God got me thinking and he initiated a conversation. How will you know it's me? If you get a buck, how will you know that it's me and not just a coincidence? How will I know it's you, Lord? How will you know it's me? <laughs> so after kind of going back and forth on that for a minute, okay, I thought about this for a while. I said, Lord, I will know that it is you. If a buck comes in and he stops broadshot, broadside to me and I shoot at it and miss and the buck does not move at all. And then I shoot again and I get it. Then I would know that it's you. Then I basically forgot about it. And my thoughts went elsewhere and I continued to hunt. I'd sat there for over two hours and I was occasionally using a call to try and draw in a buck. It gets dark early in the woods and about a half hour before the end of shooting time you could start to see the shift happen. It's like someone is very slowly turning a dimmer switch. And then silently, a deer started to emerge from the shadow of the large pines that were out in front of me. This area was uh, an area that transitioned from pines into a hardwood area where I was sitting. And I watched him moving like a phantom in and amongst now the smaller pines out in front of me. And I knew it was a buck by its behavior, but what he had for antlers I couldn't tell. And like so often with bucks, he just wouldn't step out from behind that last pine tree and now into the open where I could get a good look and an easy shot. And I had my gun up and I was ready the entire time, but I had to just slowly watch him walk up the small ridge that was in front of me and out of sight. I didn't want to use my call right then because he was too close. I was concerned. It was so quiet. I was concerned I would scare him off. So I actually waited for him to leave. He walked out of sight. Of course, when that happened, my heart sank a little bit. And I was like, oh, he was right there. He was so close, and now he's out of sight. But I used my call again, and I hit it again. And a few minutes later, he came trotting across the top of the little ridge and down a little to my left. And I had my gun up and ready. And when I saw he was a legal buck, I put my crosshairs just behind his shoulder and squeezed the trigger. When I quickly recovered from the blast and the recoil, I was kind of startled to see that he did not move one bit. 
He didn't even slightly twitch an ear or a whisker. He looked like a statue. So I quickly worked the action of my pump rifle, chambered another round, and again put the crosshairs behind the shoulder and squeezed the trigger. And he dropped right there. Now, I have to say, I'm not bragging here, but I'm a pretty good shot. Okay, I don't miss shots like that. 50, 60 yards, broadside, I don't miss shots like that. So later on, as I was, I went and re-examined like, what happened here. I could see that when I raised my rifle up to shoot at him the first time, that there was a tree and there was a, a branch and there was a tiny little tip or end of that branch that went out. And it went right in front of my barrel when I shot the first time. I was looking through my scope. I couldn't see that. But it was enough at that distance and that close to my barrel to throw my bullet off. Wow. God. He pays attention to the details, doesn't he? The second time when I, I, I kind of had shifted a little bit, I went up a little bit higher, so I didn't have that problem the second time. Uh, my shot was right on, right in the heart. Now the other thing I want to mention is that in Jody's dream, it was Jordan who got the buck. Could it be that the dream was slightly off? I suppose that's possible with prophecy at times, that could be mostly right, but there's a piece or an element of it that's slightly off. But there's also depths to a prophecy that are not always fully understood in the moment, such as in this case, an impartation that day of a generational blessing. And when Jordan got his first buck years later, it was in fact a very beautiful four-pointer. And the other thing is how those who receive prophecy impact its outcome. I will add that I was expectant for both of us. And I went hunting that day believing that I might be the one to tap the buck. I pursued the blessing of God as much as I pursued the buck. So as my buck lay there in front of me, I was in amazement. Did this really just happen? It sure did. It sure did. Wow. Lord, yes, okay, I get it. I know it is you, Lord, thank you. I know you are Lord. I know it is you, Lord, thank you. When God answers your prayers, do you know that it's him? When he provides for you, do you know that it's him? When he shows his power on your behalf, do you know that it's him? When he does what he says he's going to do, do you know that it's him? When you receive a blessing, do you know that it's Him? When you witness a miracle, do you know that it is Him? Because He wants us to know Him. I'm going to turn to Exodus 6, 6. Therefore, <clears throat> say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Now let's look at 7.5. It's on the next page in my Bible. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. 
when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Hallelujah. Let's turn to 1 Kings 18.36. First Kings eighteen thirty six. These are some familiar scriptures, and probably most, if not all, of you have revisited these recently. Pastor brought forth scriptures from this, these passages recently. This is Elijah in the showdown on Mount Carmel with the four hundred and fifty prophets of Baal, and. Without reading the first few verses, this is, of course, where Elijah told Ahab to gather all of Israel and all the prophets of Baal, and he alone was the prophet of the Lord. And then he said, and I didn't plan on reading this, and the pastor brought this uh, forth recently, 20, verse 21 says, And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. So Elijah then says, Well, let's have this showdown. Let's have this contest between your God, the prophets of Baal, and the Lord, my God. And so there's two bulls to be offered as a sacrifice to be consumed by fire. And he allows them to choose one, and he has the other. And they prepare the bull for sacrifice. And they spend all day calling on their God, their gods, to consume the sacrifice with fire, wailing, screeching, chanting, cutting themselves. And of course, their God doesn't answer. And then Elijah, well, let's pick up with 36, verse 36. He had prepared the altar of the Lord. He had prepared it. He had prepared the sacrifice. And he says, and it came, and of course, you remember this story? I mean, he even had him, he had him dump so much water on it that it was actually like a pool of water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and executed them there. God has a way of making himself known, doesn't he? Amen. Jeremiah 24, 6 through 7 says, God says, For I will set my eyes on them for good. And I will bring them back to this land. I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. Then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. Now we have all heard the prophecies concerning President Trump, the 2016 election, and this election. 
Going back to Kim Clement, I will make Trump a trumpet. And he will be president for two terms. That's me being Kim Clement. Two terms, says the Lord. And many, many other prophets said the same. And they didn't get it wrong. But Satan and those aligned with him are trying to steal this election through fraud and corruption. And it is obvious to anyone who has eyes to see and ears to hear. Now we all need to have spiritual discernment, which is a, a gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's imperative in this time. But the corruption in this election is so obvious that anybody should be able to see it easily. Unless you are just completely blinded by the enemy of your soul. We are in the midst of a showdown between the prophets of Baal and God's prophets and his people. Do we believe God or do we believe the enemy of our soul that does nothing but steal, kill, and destroy? And we need to guard our gates. So close the door on the lie. Do not give the enemy access to your soul. Just as we see with the evil, lying media in this nation, who are the modern-day prophets of Baal, do not give them place. Turn them off, shut them up, and shut them out. And just as the 450 prophets of Baal were immediately seized and killed, I believe the evil, corrupt media in this nation will be swiftly silenced. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. 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 Amen. Hallelujah. President Trump is God's anointed for such a time as this. He is God's man. He loves this country. And he is, along with Abraham Lincoln, the best president we have ever had, without question. Amen. But this election is not just about him. It's about what God wants to do through him, the ecclesia, and this nation. If President Trump had just won easily in the landslide that actually happened, I believe that we would not see the fullness of God's plan for this nation to come to pass. Mm -hmm. Remember, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh mm -hmm. to not let Israel go. It wasn't just about letting Israel go. The details of how matter. <clears throat> and first and foremost, it must be obvious to all that it is God who does this thing. And what is corrupt must be exposed and pulled down. Amen. So God can raise up that which is righteous. Amen. Because this is ultimately about the massive global harvest that is coming Amen. with the Great Awakening. Amen. Now this is not a political message. I am not a politician. I am a Christian who loves my God and my country. Amen. God hates sin. He hates corruption. Corruption entered into the world through sin and Satan. And those who practice and stand for corruption are of their father, the devil. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Psalm 14.1 says, The fool says in his heart there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and it is exceedingly corrupt. Who can know it? Eliot's commentary says of this, The heart is deceitful. The sequence of ideas seems as follows. If the blessing and the curse are thus so plainly marked, as God says in Deuteronomy 30, 19, right? I set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Choose life that it may be well with you and your children. If it is so plainly marked, how is it that man chooses the curse and not the blessing? How is it that he chooses the portion of the heath in the desert, death, 
rather than that of the tree planted by the waters, life. And the answer is found in the inscrutable, that is, impossible to understand, self-deceit of his nature, blinding his perceptions of good and evil. A pastor shared this thought with me this week, which fit perfectly into this message. Jesus taught about the leaven of sin, the leaven of the Pharisees, which leads to corruption, and the leaven of heaven, which is Jesus Christ, which leads to righteousness, both of which are competing to leaven the whole. As Paul warned to the Corinthians who were endorsing a certain sin in their church, in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Sin corrupts. As Paul says in Romans 6, 16, obedience to sin leads to death, and obedience to God leads to righteousness. Jesus came to make the corruptible incorruptible, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 53. And just as Jesus cleaned the temple, he is also cleansing his church right now. He is overturning the tables of the corrupt, burning away the sin and the dross, and casting out the devils behind the altars and in the pews. The truth sometimes comes from strange and unlikely places, such as when the high priest Caiaphas prophesied in John 11, 51, 53, that Jesus should die for the people. He said, should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. And then he plotted to kill him. The truth sometimes come, comes from strange and unlikely places. Joe Biden recently said, what is happening around this election is a battle for the soul of a nation. Socialist George Orwell said, Power is tearing human minds to pieces and putting them together again in shapes of your own choosing. Think about that for a second. Think about the evil of that. Power is tearing human minds to pieces and putting them together again in shapes of your own choosing. If that is you, if the enemy has done that to you, I say no more. Praise God. Don't let him do it any longer. Jesus came to give you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Thank you. Give your life to Jesus and allow him to restore your soul, restore your mind. Most people thought George Orwell's novel 1984 was something like silly science fiction. Little did we appreciate that it is the enemy's playbook to destroy this nation. Something to introduce it into our high schools and make it standard reading for everybody. Interesting how that works as you introduce a concept so that it becomes familiar to them. And when they see it happening before their eyes 30 years later, it's familiar. Mm -hmm. God has made us three part beings, spirit, soul, and body. The soul is all our thoughts, our thinking, our affections, our focus, how we understand, what we believe. And this is also what the soul of a nation is, what we stand for, what we think and believe, and what we declare. I recently heard a former Republican congressman say, the Democrats obviously stole the election through fraud and corruption, but we need to move on and shift our focus to the future. When I heard him say that, I came out of my chair and I rebuked the devil. I will not listen to that. Amen. Those words are not only right from Satan, they are incongruent. 
They make no sense even in the simplest terms. And yet I have even heard Christians say similar things. When you hear someone speak that way, know that they are aligning themselves with demonic strategy. And nobody wants that guy in their foxhole with them. I would rather be in a foxhole by myself than have him in there with me. Because he is going to run when the battle is on the line. And he is so spineless that there is obviously nothing for which he will stand his ground. In 1776, in the midst of the Revolutionary War, Thomas Paine said, These are the times to try men's souls. To try something is to test it. To determine what it's made of. To determine what you really believe and where you stand. Payne continued, the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows <coughs> how to put a proper price upon its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. I recently heard Pastor Alan Didio minister on the following scriptures. If you'll turn with me to 1 Samuel 12. First Samuel twelve fourteen. <clears throat> it says that if you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. God responds to the actions of his people. Let's turn to Jeremiah 10. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck it up, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight, so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. God responds to the people of a nation. Let's turn to 2 uh, Peter 1.10.
Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. Make your election sure. Take your stand for righteousness. Understand that not only is it for your own benefit, but your individual election shores up the national election. Amen. Your individual stand shores up the national stand. Yes. You are important. You play a major role. You have a tremendous impact. And it's not just your soul that is on the line, but the soul of a nation and the souls of hundreds of millions, even billions around the world. Let's turn to Luke 21. In Luke 21, the disciples asked about the end times. And Jesus told them about the tremendous challenges. In verse 10, he says, Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Down in verse 15, he says, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. That's withstand. Wow. That's you, saints. Thank you. That's you. Hallelujah. <clears throat> verse 17, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. Amen. By your patience, possess your souls. The NIV says, for by your patience, possess your souls. It says, stand firm and you will win life. Stand firm and you will win life. It's so fitting that we should now go to Pennsylvania. On June 30th in 1863, a small advance of a Union Cavalry Division arrived in a little Pennsylvania town of Gettysburg. A short time later, a Confederate brigade of 2,500 men arrived from the opposite direction. And when they saw the Union Cavalry, they retreated a short distance from the town. Both sides knew there was going to be fighting there at Gettysburg. They knew there was going to be a battle. They just didn't know that it was going to be the battle. Saints of God, we have fought many fights, many battles, but we now find ourselves in the battle. The Union troops began securing the strategic high ground, and that night troops on both sides began arriving to shore up their positions and try to gain an advantage. And the next day, two large Confederate corps attacked and drove the Union troops out of the town. By the following day, almost all of the two armies had gathered and positioned themselves for the battle. And the Confederate General Lee committed himself and his entire army to destroying the Union right there. On the second day of the battle, the enemy tactic 
was to attack the weak flank and try to turn the entire Union Army. It was the 20th Maine Regiment under Colonel Joshua Lawrence that had been assigned to defend the Union left flank from a position later called Little Round Top. Strategically, Little Round Top would hold the key to the battle that day, and yet it remained undefended until the Confederate attack was seen heading in that direction. And Colonel Lawrence arrived there with only 358 men just 10 minutes before the enemy. They were literally the end of the line. Winston Churchill once said, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Chamberlain was given the order to defend that position at all costs. That's what he was told. Those were the words. You defend this position at all costs. When you are told to defend your position at all costs, what do you do? You defend your position at all costs. <clears throat> Dare say, most of us have never been under such orders with so much on the line before, until now. All costs means all costs. And you do not move from defending that position given any circumstances, no matter what the consequences. You are prepared to do whatever it takes to defend that position. Because of the way the Union Army was deployed, if the enemy was able to take that position, they would have been able to roll up the entire Union line, which would have been catastrophic. In overwhelming numbers, at least two and a half times what Chamberlain had, the enemy poured in like a flood to try and take Little Round Top and attacking wave after wave. After 90 minutes and running out of men and ammunition, the center of his line was beginning to falter. I want to turn to Isaiah 59, 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. In the center of the 20th main line that day was 25-year-old Sergeant Andrew Tozier, who would win the Medal of Honor for his actions. Yet his primary weapon wasn't a rifle or even a sword, but rather he was the color sergeant, the standard bearer. He stood in the midst of the flood and raised up the regimental standard, and he would not be moved. His Medal of Honor citation reads, at the crisis of the engagement, this soldier, a color bearer, stood alone. He stood alone in an advanced position. That means they had started retreating. He was out front by himself with a flag. Standard. The regiment, having been borne back, and he defended his colors 
with musket and ammunition, he picked up at his feet. He stood there with a standard. Now the best soldiers hold the line when under attack. But the best of the best, like Tozer that day, encourage all of those around them to hold the line as well. He's somebody you want in your foxhole. The men of the 20th Maine rallied around the standard and held the line. Everyone there said that without his action of raising the standard and holding the line, the enemy would have overrun their position. God's standard is righteousness. Yeah. And when he lifts up a standard, he is proclaiming who he is and what he stands for. And nothing can withstand that. At that point, nearly out of ammunition and depleted of men, Colonel Chamberlain knew that they could not withstand another attack, another wave. So he ordered his men to fix bayonets. He pulled out his sword, and he gave the 20th Maine the order to charge the enemy. By accounts from that day, it was a young Lieutenant Holman Melchior, who with his sword waving, sprinted out in front of his men and charged at the enemy, with Sergeant Tozier carrying the standard close behind him, and Colonel Chamberlain with a wounded foot not far behind them. Twice an enemy rifleman had Colonel Chamberlain in his sights, but for some reason, chose not to shoot. And then an enemy officer stood and pointed a pistol just feet from Chamberlain's face and pulled the trigger. But the gun misfired. And Chamberlain took the man who just tried to kill him prisoner. The charge was so successful that the much larger enemy force that had been attacking them and about to overrun them instantly surrendered as in shock. That day, the enemy attacked the Union flank. The next day, they attacked the Union middle. And another heroic stand crushed the enemy forces. And while there was a lot of hard fighting ahead, Gettysburg was the turning point of the war. The truth is that these were just average men like you and me, but they understood the importance of the moment, the moment that they found themselves in. They knew it was on the line, and that's why they held it at all costs. The truth is, is that many in this nation are blind, ignorant, and indoctrinated. They don't understand what is happening, what is at stake. We pray that their eyes will be open and that they will wake up and their minds will be restored. But for that to happen, we have to hold the line. Amen. George Orwell, in his book, 1984, said, Every record has been destroyed or falsified. Every book rewritten. Every picture has been repainted. Every statue and street building has been renamed. Every date has been altered. And the process is continuing day by day and minute by minute. History has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. This is the globalist, socialist, Marxist agenda. Most people thought it was science fiction. We didn't understand how serious they were about plotting to take over our nation. And all the while, they have been tearing the minds, the very souls of our children apart 
our people apart and putting them back together in an arrangement of their choosing. Putting in place a deep state within our government and establishing control over all the mountains of our culture, including media, which perpetually reinforces their lies. Jean Bailey from America Stands on the Victory Channel. Excellent, by the way. If you're going to watch something, I would encourage you to watch the Victory Channel, America Stands. He gave us this chilling reminder. In the last nine months, your government has done this. It has dictated where you may go and when, who you may see and how close you may stand, what you can say, if you can sing, if you can walk your dog, if your child is interrogated upon returning to school, and if you and all your contacts from Thanksgiving are then put into confinement. Contact information of who you spent your time with, who is isolate, where, and for how long. When and if you can take a vacation or even go out to eat. If you can send your child to school, if your business can stay open, if and when you can bury a loved one, if you can visit your parents in a nursing home, if you can find out what is actually happening in the world, and what candidates you can listen to and which ones you cannot. If you can hear your president give the most important address he has ever done. If you can defend yourself, your family, and your own personal property. What holidays you and your family may celebrate and with who. If you're capable enough to distinguish truth from lies. If you should vote for yourself or they should change your vote for you. Wake up, people of America. Wake up. Jesus said the truth shall set you free, but it is the truth you know that sets you free. Ronald Reagan said over 50 years ago, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We will preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we will sentence them to take the first step into a thousand years of darkness. If we fail, at least let our children and our children's children say of us, we justified our brief moment here. We did all that could be done. President Reagan fought this same enemy and defeated it temporarily. But the root of evil remained. It wasn't cut out of the ground and burned up in the fire. And that is what we must do now. There must be nothing left of it when we are done. Nothing, nothing left. Nothing. Just as King Solomon tested the hearts of the two women who claimed the same baby, saying, cut the baby in two, and give half to each one. God has tested the hearts of his people who love this nation and the hearts of those who want to destroy this nation. God is mercy and justice. You can't have one without the other, and they are both coming to this nation. God will not allow this nation to be divided, and he will not allow it to be stolen by those who want to destroy it. Rejoice, saints of God. We live in exciting times. God has placed us here and now for a reason, for a purpose. And I am proud to be a Christian today when it really matters. President Trump recently said, we will never give up. We're going to win this thing. Thank you for your encouragement, Mr. President. I thank God for the anointing on you. I love and respect you, and I stand with God and with you. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard. So 
So I say to the ecclesia today, with my sword in hand, charge! 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 Go get them, take them captive, and take back our land. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And amen.